the cards, the cards, the cards will tell the past, the present, and the future as well. Yeah, uh, just so we're clear, I can't sing. I have not convinced myself I can sing, but that does not mean you are going to stop me. Bar weep, granar weep, ninibon, my friends. Part two of the bonanza. Part one is in the description below. Why don't we just get into it? No long preamble for this one. Let's just get to the good stuff straight away. Let's start with the very first pack. Card one. Ooh, hello. Slug here is one of the Dinobots. If you saw the first one, then you probably remember me talking about how Swoop is not a jerk. Well, sometimes a jerk. Slug here is on the opposite end of the spectrum. That being, he is the biggest jerk in the Dinobots. He is callous to those around him. He is violent, loud, reckless, obnoxious. Doesn't get along with any of the Autobots and hardly gets along with any of the Dinobots as it is. He's a big bad Triceratops with a big bad attitude and he can breathe fire. What's not to love? Well, I will tell you one thing that some people didn't like about him. His name. His original name from 1984 was Slag. Well, I was gonna call him Slag, but I think he took it as an insult. Yeah, eventually Hasbro just decided to change his name. And the name is still befitting of the character. I think Slug is in a bullet, like a big, thick, hearty bullet just barreling towards you at high speeds. Again, big bad Triceratops with a big bad attitude. Love the Dinobots, love Slug. Again, he is the biggest jerk, and that's why I love him. Pack 2. I'm hoping for a Thundercracker, Shrapnel, and the rest of the Dinobots. Like, if I can just get those and everything else duplicates, I'll be quite happy, actually, because then I'll complete my Seekers, my Dinobots, and my Insecticons. Ooh, hey, Jazz! Yes, alright! We're off to a fantastic start! What can I say about Jazz? Other than he's probably the coolest Autobot who's ever existed. I mean, you name a cooler Autobot. I'm waiting. He is right up there next to Wheeljack as one of my favorite G1 characters. He's a lover of culture, a lover of music, and he just seems chill. And considering he's one of Optimus Prime's most trusted soldiers and one of the most dangerous and high-ranking Autobots there is, that's just such a fun character. And his design conveys that. Those iconic ears at the top of his head that even the movie version of Jazz had. I want to note the white thing in his hand. I was wondering if that was his grappling hook. Jazz has a grappling hook. He used it in one of the very first G1 episodes. And then in the Fall of Cybertron video game, it was his ability, which allowed you to do a lot of cool platforming stuff. So much fun was had playing those games. But looking at the card now, there was literally nothing for his grappling hook to grab onto, so yeah, it's probably just a gun. Moving on to his vehicle mode, it's such a swanky vehicle mode. Bright white with red and blue decals all along it, the huge spoiler, which you can't see all that well in the card art here, but... No, I'm not complaining. It is still such good art, and it still shows Jazz's vehicle mode off in all of its classy, swanky, stylish glory. I do want to know the consistency between both the bot mode and the robot mode, being that there's missiles being fired at him from that direction over there on both sides. Quite nice to have that little bit of extra consistency between both sides of the cards. I can't help but feel that Jazz gets done dirty quite a lot. To get straight up murdered in the very first movie. Was about to join the main cast of Transformers Animated, but the show gets cancelled. Hasn't had a masterpiece figure yet. Justice for Jazz, I say. I demand a masterpiece figure, and I demand a movie. I'm not thinking about that, by the way. A Jazz solo movie, a la Bumblebee? Just plug it right into my veins, man. Pack number three. And... Ah, uh, it is a duplicate. I will say that I think I like the truck mode side more than I like the robot mode side. Like, truck mode is just going at it full pelt and launching into the air, and robot mode, he just is kind of pulling a typical Optimus Prime heroic pose, pointing forward. Go, Autobots! I'm not going to spend that much time talking about Optimus Prime. He's Optimus Prime. You already know. Pack four. This has to be based off her thrilling 30s toy, which I think is based on her IDW look. I think I'm right about that. I was wrong. Whilst it has some similarities in that, yes, this does turn into a motorcycle and so does the thrilling 30s offering, they are not the same design. The thrilling 30s design turns into a strange sci-fi or alien motorcycle, whilst this one is clearly just an Earth motorcycle. 
and the robot modes share some design cues, but that probably comes down to them both being chromia, rather than both being the same design. Also, whilst I'm here, the Thrilling 30s design is potentially loosely based off the IDW design, but is not the exact same design as the IDW version. I mean, the main thing that makes me think Thrilling 30s is the alt mode, which is a motorcycle. One of the things I really like about the side is the hologram rider that you see right here. And also with the consistency between both modes that I was talking about with Jazz, you got a little explosion here next to her vehicle mode, and you get a massive explosion all the way behind her in her bot mode. And the more I think about it, the more I want to get my hands on the Thrilling 30s Chromia. I mean, I've got Siege Chromia, but, you know what, let's not focus on that. Let's focus on how great this card looks. Like, I'm so glad characters like Chromia are getting the love that they absolutely deserve. Just a badass fembot who deserves to be recognized as one of the franchise's first, and possibly one of the franchise's best. Number five. Ah, Ramjet. Ah, uh, yeah, he's a duplicate, but he's actually the first card I got when I first bought a pack for the TCG. And because of that, I feel like I need to show some respect to this card, because I saw the art for Ramjet and thought, wow, that looks fantastic. And he does, he looks fantastic, doesn't he? But as cool as bot mode looks, I love his vehicle mode art. It's just so intense, as he is quite clearly nosediving towards some poor fool who is going to get absolutely wrecked. Alright, pack six. Oh, hey! Top Shop! I don't have much to add to the conversation in regards to the Deluxe Insecticons. I couldn't tell you what their personalities were off the top of my head, and I struggled to remember what all their names were. But, their designs... fantastic. Like, the coloration for the Deluxe Insecticons is eye-catching, and those designs are applied to some wildly alien-looking Decepticons, man. These guys just look monstrous in both modes. And looking at the artwork here, that's been captured exquisitely. The art here is distressingly close to Chop Shop, like you can't see the whole bug, but you're kind of almost within the jaws of this giant robot monster insect. And then you flip him back to his robot mode, and you see he's just cast in so much shadow. It's a little hard to make out some of the details, but because the robot modes for all of these cards are foiled, you just get little glimpses of his eyes and the teeth and his claws. He may be cast in shadow, but you can still have a pretty good idea of what's going on mostly. It's just a few minor details here obscured by the darkness. Oh, it's so... Good. Number seven. Ah, oh, more Starscream. The arrogance that Starscream is known and loved for perfectly displayed here. That amazing Seeker design is just shining brightly as he quickly dashes out from the shadows, assuming to take out someone from behind. Because looking at the art, it does look like he was skulking in the shadows, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Obviously for his jet mode, he's just a fantastic looking F-15 Raptor. Megatron has fallen! I Starscream am your new leader! Oh, you treacherous little schemer, you. Love you, but I'd love you a lot more if I didn't already have you. Pack number eight, past the halfway mark. I am so buzzed to get my hands on the Earthrise, Thundercracker, and Skywarp. Like, they look so good. We were just talking about you! Welcome to the party, pal! Thundercracker is my favourite Decepticon simply because he's not sure if he actually is on the right side of the war. He knows he's better than us tiny fleshlings in his mind, but that gives him every reason to not go around squishing us like bugs. What's the point in it? That characterization was so beautifully explored in the IDW comics, starting with the All Hail Megatron story and continuing beautifully from there. And he got a pet dog named Buster and he was suddenly just one of the most likeable characters in all of Transformers for me. I'm a dog lover, and so is Thundercracker. It makes me very happy. You know, I just realized, I talked about how much personality Thundercracker has, but if you watch the G1 cartoon, it doesn't actually come through all that much. Neither does Skywalk's personality. They're just kind of a pair of scepter thugs in the cartoon. It's really like later versions of the characters that you do start to see their personalities really come through. This card, utterly divine. It's the same awesome, classic, amazing Seeker body I've talked about ad nauseum at this point. I'm honestly not sure if there's a color scheme the Seeker body wouldn't look good in. And then of course, flipping him over to his jet mode, there he is engaged in a dogfight. There's missiles flying everywhere, smoke trails all over the place. A perfect battlefield for a brilliant warrior. And I am so glad to have him, because now, there we are, reunited at last. I'm so happy with that. So very happy. 
Next pack. <laughs> all hail Lord Megatron! Finally! Where have you been all this time? You're a common card and it took you this long to show up. Okay, Megatron, the most mega of Trons. I'm a little shaky on timeline, so I'm not sure which version of Megatron this is based off. Part of me wants to say Titan's Return Megatron because I'm not sure if Siege Megatron was out at the time of the first wave of the card game. I mean, it could just be a partially original design that has different aspects of a whole bunch of different versions of Megatron. That may be why I can't pin down the exact version of the character I'm looking at here, but either way, it's still a lovely looking Megatron, isn't it? The background here in the tank mode is just all very smoky and kind of looks like he's just driven right through a wall or blown something up that was there and now is just driven through the rubble. And you move on to his robot mode and looking at it, I just realized it's kind of mirroring the Optimus Prime card from before. See? They're pointing in opposite directions and the vehicle modes are also charging in opposite directions. I feel like these are actually sort of meant to be like that. There we go. That's a bit better. Why throw your life away so recklessly? That's a question you should ask yourself, Megatron. I apparently can't do either Optimus Prime or Megatron. That's actually really saddening. Alright, on to the next pack, and I believe it's pack number 10. Here we go. Hey, Cosmos! Alright, awesome. So, just looking at pop mode, I dare anyone who doesn't know to guess what this little green man turns into. A UFO? Duh. I mean, if you want to convince people that you're not an alien from outer space, you naturally would want to disguise yourself as a UFO. Yeah, Cosmos kind of bucked the more than meets the eye robots in disguise trend that basically became irrelevant by 1986 due to the fact that all of humanity knew about the Transformers at that point. And then, like, onward, they just were kind of like, yeah, we, we turn into alien jets and planes and tanks and giant robot wolves and whatnot now. And Cosmos is kind of a weird looking bot in general, like he's got a very rounded design due to the fact that he turns into a flying saucer. Especially when compared to some of his contemporaries, he just seemed a little, a little out of place. I mean, that's not a bad thing. I love Cosmos. Cosmos is great. His alt mode being a flying saucer and his robot mode being a bit different because of it is actually in his favor because not only is his design memorable, but it's unique and it helps him stand out from the rest of the crew. And the same goes for the card right here. You naturally get the opportunity to have him in space, which separates him visually from the rest of the cards just purely on background and circumstance alone. Not much is going on for that in the bot mode, as I say that, like I thought there might have been a media share in the background there, but when you turn him to his alt mode, there he is flying well high above the earth, looking rather adorable while doing it. Cosmos is also an example of a character whose alt mode, due to it being kind of like a fantasy design, means they can kind of get away with some nonsense they wouldn't be able to before. You tell me why a UFO can have a big red dome at the top of it. Like, when you look at the robot mode, it's blatantly his head, but... Honestly, if you didn't know this was a Transformer, it would just be a regular UFO. Because, you know, UFOs are pretty standard around these parts. Pack number 11. Ooh. Oh, hello! Flame War! Okay, cool. So, this is going to be interesting because I know very little about Flame War. I mean, I could just look up a TF wiki page and just recite what's there verbatim and say that that's my contribution to the conversation. I'm not going to do that, but I will look up a TF wiki page. Her first entry refers to timelines, which I absolutely am not all that versed in timelines. She has only got action figures from Botcom, it seems. Like, she's never had a, a full standard release figure. Her largest entry on TF Wiki actually is in regards to the new IDW continuity. TF Wiki says that she's apparently a spy, a saboteur, a scientist. A little out of my depth there, so I can't comment on that, but I can comment on the way this card looks. This might be one of the most badass looking Decepticon fembots I have seen. Just straight up, she looks insane. The mostly black or gunmetal grey type colour scheme with the fire decals on top. Her bot mode makes her look like she's decked out in some kind of fantasy armour. That may have a lot to do with the fact that she's got a bow and arrow for a weapon, which I am totally for. 
that is great. Her design is very sharp and intense here as well, like she's got a lot of little spikes and bladed bits all along her body. It doesn't look impractical, nor does it look like any of it's designed to hurt anyone. It just looks like it was stylized to look very, very dangerous, of which she does. Now, flipping it over to the vehicle mode, she's a motorcycle. And just like Chromia, she's got a hologram rider, but I don't really see the need for her having one, because it looks like she's in the middle of a fire tornado, and at that point in time, robot in disguise doesn't seem so critical anymore. So her design here is based on the Botcon toys. Her Botcon toy is a repaint remold of Energon RC, and Energon RC is a fembot who turns into a motorcycle, and her weapon is kind of like a crossbow slash bow and arrow type deal. There's then a second toy of Flamor, which is another repaint remold of RC, but this time it's Prime RC. I'm definitely going to research further into Flame War though, and without even knowing much about her, I already want them to go ahead and release a more mass market figure for her. She would be a unique addition to any shelf. I mean, if any mainline release toy of Flame War looked half as good as this art here, oh yeah, yeah, that's going to be something else. On to pack 12, and it's at this point in time where it turns out that it's going to be nothing but swoops. Hey! Alright! Well, look who is! It's Mirage! He talks like that, right? I mean, I'm not sure how great my impression was, but he, he talks like that. Like, he talks like he's a member of the Rat Pack. He's got that very deep voice that makes him sound like an old-school lounge singer or crooner. Actually, before I go on, I, I just want to note, I'll always remember, in More Than Meets the Eye Part 3, Mirage sabotages the Decepticon ship, jumps out of it, Parachutes down, like he's, you know, just the world's greatest super spy. And then when Prime, you know, jokes at him about it, like, Oh, I knew you really wanted to get back to Cybertron, Mirage. Mirage's response is just... Sorry, Prime. The ship was full. Sorry, Prime. The ship was... full. Alright, looking at the actual card, there's a moment of sadness to be had. See, the very first chug style Transformers toy I ever got was Classics Mirage, which this seems to be heavily based on. And I loved that toy. I loved it a lot. But he broke. Looking back on it now, I kind of want to get one again, just simply because it was the first chug figure I ever owned. And looking at my chug collection now, where I've got like a hundred, it, it just feels like Going back to, what, 2007 is when I got it? It'd be nice to have him again. The two things that really bring this home as Classics Mirage for me is the gun and his backpack. You see Mirage turns into an F1 racing car. The front of the car was split into two pieces. The very front of it would become a gun that Mirage could use, and the rest of it would fold up onto his back with the wheels sort of hanging off of it. It was a bit of a bizarre looking backpack, but because of Mirage's long and slender design, it actually kind of fit into the character's aesthetic. And the gun was a bit weird, because it was just the front of an F1 racing car. It was like literally just this bit here, which kind of fits Mirage, because if Mirage was a Dungeons and Dragons class, he'd be a rogue. Like he's some kind of really classy spy. And like a mini hand crossbow, that's a pretty fitting weapon for a classy spy. He's really going for it here, isn't he? Look at all the sparks and the smoke coming off of his wheels. Like, because of the shape and nature of an F1 racing car, it always looks and sounds wild whenever they just rev up and go. But straight up here, it looks like he's damaging the road. <laughs> Either he's racing towards something he really needs to get to, or he's being chased by something he really doesn't want catching him. Flipping back to robot mode, the destruction continues. It's just falling debris everywhere. Like, Mirage, man, what have you gotten yourself into? Like, are you okay? So you have to wonder, which city is about to spend just a lot of money on contractors to rebuild this place? And the funny thing is, he's an upperclassman. He'd be the sort of guy who would attend a swingers party. He could go to fancy balls. He would go cyber fox hunting. Like, he would do rich guy things. But well, the rest of the Autobots are commoners. I mean, genuinely, I just have so much love for Mirage for a hundred different reasons. A genuinely talented martial artist by the seams of things and he can turn invisible, and he can just like casually jump from a crashing spaceship like he does it every other day. So if I don't put him down and stop talking about him now, I could probably go on for at least another 10 minutes. Pack 13. <laughs> Here we go. 
The first duplicate of the three. While I've got Skywarp here, I just want to say... Skywarp is Cyclonus. I mean, that's just my opinion, and to be honest, I kind of prefer like what most other versions of the franchise do with Cyclonus, and that just being he's his own individual. Because that way, we get two awesome characters. The second to last pack. Ah, uh, there we go, Hound. See, it's coming true, the prophecy was foretold. Not much more I can really add to what I said in part one, really. Like, Hound is great, he and Cliff Jumper are like, together forever in my head. Movie Hound is a great character, I just kind of wish he wasn't named Hound. The uh, Universe Hound is a really good figure. Told you I couldn't add anything new to the conversation. The very final pack. Okay, that's a good one. That, that, that's good. Ransack. Like I said with Chop Shop, I don't really have much to add to the conversation. In fact, Ransack, when I hear the name, the first thing I'll think of is Cybertron Ransack. Alright, what are you, Ransack? You're uh, like a grasshopper or... A... Are you a cricket? I think he's a cricket. Or a cicada. Chop Shop is a stag beetle, Barrage is a rhinoceros beetle, the team leader is Venom, who's the only deluxe insecticon I don't have a card for, and he turns into a cicada, and Ransack turns into a locust. Yeah, I can see that. Alright, that makes sense. Actually, Ransack is a very fitting name for a giant robot locust. Again, look at the brilliant colour scheme going on here. I've noticed that all three Deluxe Insecticons I've got have a really close-up shot of the insect mode, which is a little unnerving, a little uncomfortable in a way, and I love it. It makes it feel like this giant robot insect monster is right on top of you, and that is a terrifying thought. Like, giant insects are genuinely terrifying because of what insects can do to things that are smaller than them, but it's like a giant robot insect, and it's incredibly intelligent, and it wants to hurt you. Wait a moment, is that an SMG? Yeah, that genuinely looks like an alien submachine gun to me. I, I don't know what you're seeing, but I know what I'm seeing, and it's an alien submachine gun. What can I say? In a way, ending on Ransack is good because he helps get me close to completing a set, but in a way, it also feels a little anticlimactic because the Deluxe Insecticons are kind of like lower tier G1 characters. So I haven't really experienced any media with them in it. I was genuinely shocked when I saw they were in the card game. At least you can make the argument for these guys that they were from G1, like they were from the second year of the toy line. So they're actually very early characters for the franchise. And you can also make the argument that this is a card game, so they've got to have, like, decks and play patterns in mind, so the Insecticons, only having three of them, yeah, no, maybe throw in the Deluxe Insecticons, so you have seven Insecticons that you can put into a deck that focuses on Insecticon play patterns. So, when I put it down like that, it does make sense to me why they're here. It's just, I don't have much to say about them because I don't know much about them. Alright, there we go. Finished the whole 30 packs. What a motley crew we have assembled here today. 18 cards, which means just over 60% of the cards in this set were brand new. You know what? I like those odds. Alright. This is, uh... Is the word fun? Okay, so from what I just opened, I got five new battle cards, which means those are all the duplicates that I have gotten from these 30 packs. There is well over 100 cards there. Uh, I have no idea where I'm putting them. Uh, speaking of having no idea where I'm putting things, uh, the box. I guess I could use it to hold the cards, but the cards sit in there a bit loosely. You can maybe also hold these in there as well, like that. What do you think? Just to store the cards I got. I mean, I got plenty of cards to store now. The part I've probably enjoyed most is talking about the characters. Like, I didn't expect to be talking about Flame War today. I still can't get over that. Flame War is in this. Flame War! I love my niche characters that I personally don't know anything about until I do way too much research into them. Like, after this, I'm probably gonna be begging for a flame war from now on from Hasbro. 
In fact, let's start. Hasbro, can I please have a flame war? Well, okay, I'm... Alright, well, I'm gonna clean uh, th this mess up now. Just card packets everywhere. Um, I'm the Howitzer Hound. I thank you for joining me today. And I hope to see you very, very soon. What are we gonna do with all this? <laughs> Alright, let's get started. Blue moon, you saw me standing alone Without a dream in my heart Without a love of my own Terrible. I really should not be putting that into the video. No one would enjoy that.